We are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our tree mob on seasonal needle drop. Our speaker today is Andrew Gapinski, who is the head of one culture at the Arboretum. This is a hybrid tree mob. So you can see we have uh, an in-person audience. We also have you all on the Zoom. If you have questions as we go along, please put those in the chat and we will address as many of those as we can. And without further ado, I will pass it over to Andrew. Well, thank you, Sarah, and welcome to our online audience. Um, we just introduced the tree mob online. And so I'm gonna repeat some of that introductory for our our participants here in person. Uh, welcome uh, to the Arnold Arboretum. My name is Andrew Kapinski. I'm the Director of Horticulture here. Uh, what that means is I work with our horticulturists and arborists to steward all of this remarkable 281 acres, isn't it? It's just amazing. Um, we stand here in the conifer collection, which is about a 24 acre parcel of the Arboretum. It represents about 1700 individual plant species we have about, uh, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, individual plants, 1,700 individual plants. It's about 200 uh, species. Um, this is one of my favorite spots in the Arboretum. Uh, and this particular time of year, and now through next spring, uh, definitely so, because of one thing, it kind of opens up a little bit. And so if we look, uh, to the ridge in the distance, you can begin to see Hemlock Hill, right? If you were to come here spring, summer, there would be more needles on the trees. Uh, it would be more dense. The view wouldn't be as opened up. And so I really appreciate staying here right in the spot. And that bench, I cited uh, that location <laughs> because of this view. Uh, and you can see the branches and the trunks. And again, you can begin to see uh, Hemlock Hill. You can see some really tall white pines in the distance, but most of the, the, the uh, horizon there is uh, uh, Hemlock. So we're here to talk about that needle loss. Why do pines and other conifers uh, lose their needles? And it is just because all trees uh, lose, lose their leaves and their needles. It's just that we don't notice it much or we don't consider the fact that evergreens aren't really fully evergreen. They're losing needles um, every year, okay? So white pine, and in the East, we get, uh, I used to work in uh, Chicago and other places. I have never worked somewhere more where I, we get the phone call every year that says, why are, are is my, usually it's that they say Christmas tree or pine tree, why, why, are, why is it dying? Uh, and it happens every autumn and, uh, we have such, in the East, have such a high population of white pine, right? And so when these phone calls typically come in, people are talking about white pine because it's so evident uh, with that loss. And so we're gonna talk about um, white pine, but we're gonna talk about other conifers. And uh, you'll learn more about why white pine is notoriously considered the plant that, uh, you know, so often alarms people, the, the seasonal needle drop, okay? So let's walk down. I have some specimens down here and we'll start talking more. So as I mentioned, all evergreens uh, lose their needles. And so I'm just going to point out if you were to come to the conifer collection just a couple of days ago, and all I did for this demonstration was pick up some needles from the ground and throw it on top of here uh, because they already dropped them off, but don't tell anybody, especially the online audience. But all the white pines would have had this appearance. And we get this phone call my white pines are losing all their needles. And then we can, you know, shake it uh, and see what the result is, right? And, and, you know, it, it, it loses it. So white pines uh, typically look like uh, this in the fall, which is very like, uh, I'd say lion's tail uh, type. And so on all trees, you can kind of count back the growth that's happening. And so uh, right here on this tree, this is this year's growth. 
right? And this was last year's growth. This was three years ago, four years ago, and you can count it back. So white pine uh, only holds their needles for two years, right? So this group growth came out this season and it'll be here next season uh, as the new growth comes out. And then these will fall off in the fall. Okay? And so white pine is that notorious plant specimen. We get the phone call because it's so dramatic. Two years, all the second year needles fall off. And you can count back, you know, and this is probably five years old. Um, I'll also point out you, on these old stems, you can see all the, where the needle scars are, where the, where the needles used to exist, okay? And if you look across the diversity of conifers, um, uh, the, the timing of that needle loss is, is different, okay? And even within uh, pines, you can have things like white pine that loses it every two years. This is bristlecone pine. Who, who has a, an estate in Colorado that they just flew in on their private jet from? Anybody? Okay. Bristlecone pine, which is a species that's isolated to small populations in Colorado, New Mexico, maybe a little bit of Arizona. It can hold its needles for 15, 16, 17 years. Okay. In our landscape where the environment isn't exactly what it's looking to do, tends to get a little diseasey and disease tolerant and you lose needles prematurely. Um, but even on this, if you were to count back, uh, there is, you know, maybe a decade worth of needles on, the, on this branch. Bristlecone pine is very slow growing, right? Uh, and that's why they're so dense. Um, it's also known as one of the oldest living trees. You know, there's documentary 4,000, 5,000 years old. Uh, some of the literature says they can get up to 7,000 years old. Um, how, how high up do they go? Are they like mid mountain? Are they, are they, are they high high they elevation? Really high up. High, high elevation. Yeah. And then, you know, these trees, uh, these ancient trees are, they might just have a few branches that are alive and then it's old and gnarly. And um, Ned, Ned Friedman, if he's out there, we're going to go collect some and do a tree mob live in Colorado. We'll, we'll do that someday. Yeah. So bristlecone pine. We'll talk more about these in a minute. And then there's things like uh, pinus sembra, so which is kind of middle of the range. So if you count back on this, and pinus sembra is Swiss stone pine uh, from the Alps, uh, Central Europe. And so you might have, oh, I don't know, needles held for four or five years. Okay, so it's, it's a gradient. So we just talked about pines. And then if you go to different, uh, uh, groups of plants like your abies. Anybody know what abies is? Your fir trees, right? So balsam fir, Fraser fir. Who has a balsam and Fraser fir in their house right now for the holiday season? Right? You didn't get it yet. All right. <laughs> Mine's sitting in a bucket outside. So, um, so fir trees. This is hemlock tree. Uh, we have uh, spruce trees. They, they're more gradual in losing their needles. So if you look at this, this uh, spruce tree, and this is um, Serbian spruce, uh, it's got needles, 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 and then they start fading away, fading away. And at the, the end here, it's almost lost all of its needles. So it's more of a gradual process that it's losing its own needles. So people complain about that less or notice it less uh, than you would, again, that white pine that startles everybody. Andrew, we had a quick question. From yes, go ahead. Someone wanted to confirm that the white pine you were referring to is that Pinus strobus. Yeah, so a question from online is white pine, uh, what's the scientific name? So it's Eastern white pine, it's Pinus strobus. Thanks. And then even further, there's conifers that lose their needles every year, right? So these are the deciduous conifers. Uh, and so here we have Larix kempferi, which uh, Japanese larch. These are, this was, I cut this out of our nursery where it's a little, little more protected and it's a little more rich and watered. And so it hasn't dropped its needles yet, but um, this will fully drop its needles. But it also is ornamental value, that fall color, isn't it? And then this is the, the dawn redwood, Metasequoia glyptostroboides that the Arnold is so uh, well known for introducing into cultivation with partners. 
uh, and that is fully deciduous. So again, there's a continuum from uh, holding your needles for 17, 20 years, or dropping them every other year, or dropping them every year. So when we say evergreen, this wouldn't be evergreen, just deciduous, but uh, conifers are entirely evergreen. So let's talk a little bit more um, about how to identify or tell the difference between some of these. And we can talk more about the, the needle loss. So pines, um, uh, we, we, th we think of uh, several different characteristics when we talk about identifying conifers. And what I wanna do is talk about kind of the general ones that people know. So pines, spruces, firs, uh, and hemlock and how to tell the difference of those. Because most people call and say, I have a pine tree and sometimes it's a spruce and they just th use the general term um, pine tree. Uh, so let's start with white pine here as an example. And I can hand around uh, samples. So if you pick off uh, needles and you can hand some of these out. Some of them aren't true to type. So those are true. So pines are born in uh, clusters uh, of needles and they're attached, you know, they're grouped together at the base. Uh, and so different pines are grouped in different numbers. Typically pines are twos, threes, or five uh, bundles. And Pinus strobus uh, is a five needle. It's really interesting if you, if you kind of, if you have a two needle pine, uh, it's, it's a little easier. I'll find it in a minute. But if you put these needles together, uh, it makes a round. Uh, you know, and so they kind of, you can make a, a circle. And, and so if you put that in your fingers, you can kind of roll it uh, really easily. Uh, I remember as a kid in Wisconsin, I used to be fascinated by that. I don't know why. Uh, but I'll hand this around and you can roll those in your fingers if you want. Grew up north, just north of Milwaukee. Here's, welcome Minnesota. Uh, this is pino, Pinus mu, mugo, or mugo pine, uh, and it's a two-needled pine, okay? So if you pull off uh, the needles, they're grouped uh, in twos, and it's really easy to put them, you know, they're half circles. Each needle's a half circle, you can put them together and roll it between your fingers, really neat. The other thing I'm gonna point down on, on mugo pine is, uh, um, this uh, sheath. So another thing in pines that differ, differs between species is how long that sheath lasts. So there's this little papery white sheath at the base of the needles. Uh, and some of that, the literature exfoliates in year one. Uh, some, sometimes it's long and persistent. Uh, and it's another characteristic for identifying certain conifers. So take a look at mugo pine, pines mugo. Uh, and it's two needles uh, and the sheets. But those fascicle, fascicle bundles uh, are a good identification uh, for needles. Okay. Just a note that that bristlecone pine, Pinus aristata, really, I love that, that scientific name, Pinus aristata, is uh, a five needled pine. Okay. And the, the other thing I want to show about bristlecone pine. Uh, is, and, and this is another, if people have bristlecone pines or see bristlecone pines, this is another question we get a lot is, what is that insect uh, that, that's on the needle? And so if you look really close at a bristlecone pine needle, it's got a single resinous dot on its needle. And every one of the needles has this little resinous dot. It is nothing but a natural process or spore where resin is being extruded but it looks just like a little scale insect, right? And so if people do have Pinus um, aristata, bristlecone pine, uh, sometimes that, that little resinous dot is confused for um, a scale insect. Everyone's gonna leave with sappy hands. You have more than two bristlecone pines. Yeah, the, 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 we have another one that's in the, uh, there's an old conifer collection above the Levitcher Garden by the Bonsai Collection. Um, if you can find, and, and they are available in nurseries, 
can find a bristle golden pine and plant it. Uh, and if you like, uh, I planted a couple back in Wisconsin and watched them develop for 15 years. It's amazing to see a young specimen, 15 years old, and all the needles are retained all the way down to the ground, right? Uh, because it's holding all its needles. And then 15, 20 years, you start losing just the base layer. But it's amazing to see this, this like fully needled on every branch for 15 years of its life. Any questions from the online audience? Uh, none right now, thanks. Um, leaves here. So there's only one of those. Is that true that each bundle only has one? Or at the, or yeah, so the question each? on the question is uh, on the Pinus aristotle, the briscoe pine. Um, there's some that don't have it. The, the resin has brushed off or washed off or something like that. Yeah. But they will each have it, yeah. We actually did Question. just it. The question here on site is how does drought affect needles? Conifers will respond to environmental conditions like any tree, you know, so a deciduous tree, if it goes into a drought response, it might prematurely drop its leaves. Uh, we tend to think about conifers being a little more resilient right uh and you know they're growing in you know some of these species are growing at rocky high elevations or um and so we tend to see less drought response on them but they they will lose in in certain conditions yeah and then uh, we have an online question thanks the question is are pines grouped by number of needles as a sign of relationship that's a great question um and I would say that there, let me, let me repeat the question for um, uh, in person. Are uh, two needles pines more closely related to each other than five needle pines? Uh, and are they, you know, are they, does, if you got five needles together, does it mean they're more closely related? Um, I don't know the exact answer to that question. Uh, my assumptions would be uh, that there are associations between you know, number of the needles and uh, relatives of each other, but I'm sure there's uh, examples of where that's not true. So let's talk, we talked about pines, groups, fascicles of uh, needles together. You can put them together and, and roll them your fingers. Let's talk about burrs um, or abies is the uh, scientific name. So when I think of abies, you think about balsam, fir, uh, and you think about uh, Fraser fir, uh, and and this is con color fir, uh, which is uh, Abies con color, uh, otherwise known as uh, white fir. Abies have flat needles, so when I'm identifying an Abies, I put it in my finger and I can't roll it. It's like, Argh! oh, uh, so you work really hard to get it to roll over because it's nice and flat. Um, it also has a blunt tip. Um, and in some ABs, it's even got like a little heart shaped end to it. Um, the other thing with ABs is who knows what stomata or stomates are? Openings. Openings yeah. So uh, if you look under a microscope at a maple leaf, you'll see these little openings uh, where gas is being exchanged uh, into the leaf. Well, conifers do the same thing. And on ABs, and we'll pass this around, on ABs, we have these stomatal lines that are really evident. So it's two white lines uh, on the bottom side of AB needles. There's a really good characteristic for identifying ABs. So if you think about the flat needle uh, and also uh, those two, two lines, so much so that uh, horticulture has selected uh, selected certain um fur species for that ornamental value uh and so this is uh called silver lock fur uh and that's the cultivar name um and you can see the the needles are curled up and the undersides are exposed and you can see those stomatal lines the white stomatal line so um it's actually an ornamental characteristic uh so i'm going to pass these two around again this is Abies. The last thing I'll note 
<clears throat> is the attachment point on Avi's uh, born singly is like a suction cup. So you can, you pull it off, that one broke. But look at the attachment point of the needles on, on Avi's, on fur, and it's like a suction, round suction cup. And when you pull a needle off, it re leaves a, a really round leaf scar. Are you saying ABEF? ABIES. Hemlock is an ABEF as well? No, we're going to get the hemlock in one second. Yes, 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 yes. Um, oh, so, and then this is uh, Picea uh, or spruce. And we talked about spruce kind of losing its needles gradually over time. So, when you, when you think about spruce and ID and you roll that between your fingers, you can roll it, but there's a click to it. Okay, and so spruce have uh, four sides to the needles, and so uh, you can roll it, but it's click, 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 click. Okay, so that's your spruce. It's also unlike um, Abies; it's got a, a sharper tip to it, pointed tip. And the attachment point is also worth noting on Abies. Um, I'm, I'm see, I'm, I'm Piscia. It's a, uh, it's like a peg. Uh, it's like a peg into the stem, so it's not that suction cup like you have on. Um, on your first. Anybody okay. bored yet? Are we? All right. Okay, so someone asked about hemlock, which is Suga. And this is uh, Suga canadensis, the Canadian hemlock. And there's Suga chinensis and other, other Sugas as well to the west. Um, someone mentioned that the stomata lines on hemlock are also uh, very uh, evident, which is true. Okay. Um, what I would say on um, hemlock is yes, those stomata lines are present. Um, and so, okay, is it is it a fur? One of the things that's really cool about um, hemlock is it's got this uh, pedicel, which is this little stem at the base of the needle. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna pass this around. But you can see there's a little white stem, right? And so look at hemlock and how the attachment point of the needle happens because it's got this little stalk that attaches this needle. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of a differentiating thing between uh, Aves and Hemlock. The other thing is the, the needle arrangement, uh, pretty flat, but if you look at the top of the, the branchlet here, there's these little mini needles uh, that are on it, which is another good identification for Hemlock. Um, typically the needles are shorter and smaller, you know, and there's a general look to it, um, but I think that that little stalked needle is a fun, fun thing to look for on hemlock. Hemlock are, uh, yeah, hemlock are um, an endangered species at this point, and a, a lot of our plants are. Uh, you think across the east, you think about ash, and you think about hemlock and beech now. Who's, who knows the uh, Blue Hills uh, or hikes the Blue Hills? Pay attention to the beaches uh, over the next couple of years. They're going to be decimated by uh, a new introduction of a pest called beech leaf disease. And so um, many of the plants we enjoy in our forests are, are really imperiled, and hemlock is one of them. Um, yeah, we, uh, we, are, we kind of pick and choose our battles when it comes to all those things. So I wanted to uh, pull out this, and I forgot to mention that this is a pine. Uh, so the other thing that to note on pines is the length of the needle, okay? Um, this is Pinus plurustris. And anybody, anybody have a good common name for this? Long needled pine. Long needled pine. <laughs> And uh, Michael Dosman, anybody know Michael Dosman, the keeper of the living collections here? He refers to this as uh, the it. Or what's that? Is it the it of the, uh, from the Adams Family? From the Adams Family movie? Um, and so when you look at this, so this is a plant wild collected. It was grown by seed uh, here uh, at the Arnold. And it arrived here as a seed in 2017. How many years ago is that? Five years ago. So uh pinus plurustris the question is uh, where is it native to its native range it's a, a southeast 
so this would be like Florida panhandle and Georgia. It's a southern southern species. And that's why we don't have any big ones in the collections right now. But with climate change, we're testing more and more southern species, of course. So when you look at this, uh, Pinus plurustris, the it, it pine, um, uh, it, it starts out, it, it grows, and it, it has this big, big needles for a couple of years, very, very low, and then it starts growing up. But if you count back and you look at the base of it, it just started to lose you know it's all this needles so again uh, this is a species that's holding its needles for um five years we look at that wow. bundle sheath uh which is really evident this is a three needled pine isn't that cool yeah. um and uh what would you say that's probably that's a little over a foot yeah. well, maybe maybe 10 inches 18 inches long some of these needles so it varies six to 18 inches long with Pinus plurustris. We have seven of these. Uh, and the uh, Tiffany Enzenbacher, the head of plant production, uh, was not happy I was taking one. <laughs> <laughs> so I promised it. I'd bring it back. Um, uh, yeah. Is that considered slow growth after five years? Uh, what it does in, in its early stages, it, it gains some diameter. So it like sits there and grows in a little bulk and then starts going up. So what I would say to your question is, I think this is a pretty stocky five-year-old pine because it's been putting a lot of growth into its, 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 its the girth of it. And as a, now it's starting to grow up. So we reviewed whether we were gonna put this out uh, and it's going out blooming spring. So this will be going out next spring. Yeah. And so we, is, it, is there a big one growing now? Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's Yeah, I, uh, it, uh, yes. Okay, it's respiring. Um, and uh, is it growing? No, it's kind of in a dormant state, but there's still processes happening. It's uh, still producing chlorophyll, it's still taking in light, but it's just much slow. And so it's the growth will happen in the spring. You know, you'll get bud break and then followed by um, cambial growth. And now it's just kind of sitting there. But it's a good question of whether the pines are growing. I would say not really, but yeah. Um, all right. See if I'm missing anything else here. So we, oh, we have a question, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a question about pollen, um, pollen, and we had a tremendous pollen year this past spring, and uh, I got this incredible video from my office window, um, and so white pine uh, are planted in such numbers uh, around that you get these massive releases of pollen, and uh, there's a lot of different factors that will determine uh, like how much pollen is being released like previous seasons environmental conditions and how much uh, energy the plant is putting into reproductive um, uh, you know pollen and cones um, and then just the right time so some seasons it's kind of a steady thing where it happens over several weeks this past year it like it was like one day and just this massive release of pollen uh, and so a lot of factors go into how that happens and I just wanted to point out some other common uh, plants that you see, like uh, Thuya uh, or Arborvitae. Uh, again, it's one of those things that's losing its needles gradually. It's got what I would say are uh, scale-like needles on it, kind of a flat thing. Um, this is Juniper. Juniper is another one. Uh, it has flat uh, scale-like needles, but it also has a secondary type of needle called, oh boy, maybe I didn't get a specimen with it uh an all like needle there's got to be some on here which is kind of sharp and prickly uh yeah there's just two different needle types um there has to be one on here hmm. sometimes it, they not all branches have all of them but uh oh here look at that so do you see the difference between 
uh, these two needle types. Same plant, oh, yeah. same oh, yeah. plant, right? So you have a what they call an all like needle, A W L, and then a scale like needle. Uh, and so junipers characteristically have those two needle types. Thank you. Anybody want to see this? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And then finally, I'll just point out uh, uh, your typical U uh, taxis, uh, where again, flat needles, um, you know, it retains really good green. The bottom is also really green, like it's just a lighter green. Um, and so that's your taxis. But again, it's um, taxis uh, needle loss is kind of unique. Uh, and I sh should mention this. So, taxis. We don't get the phone calls as often, but some people say, "What happened? What's going on in the Texas?" Because Texas loses its annual needles in the uh, spring uh, and summer. So uh, needles fell off here. You would have had this bright yellow grouping of needles uh, in late spring and er early summer. Uh, so watch your Texas plants in late spring, early summer. That's when it's it's losing its uh, old needles. In the Texas yeah yeah there's many many fam many families within the general group of conifers right. yeah. a, a few years ago i had a, a discussion with all of them. Recovered. That so the question is there's a specimen that lost all of its needles yeah, it really was, it was, and what kind of plant was it, it was a taxis, a yeah. uh, interesting a, a taxis a yew shrub that lost all its needs but it seems like it's recovering yeah um many factors to go into that. Sometimes it's too wet uh, of, of a location. Sometimes it's pest and disease. Um, something to watch though. Probably not a good thing. Yeah. Are there uh, any questions from online? There are. Um, we have some what, online questions. Question was, do needles grow back in the same place or different places? And so the question is, do needles grow back in the same place or different places? Uh, and the answer is different places. So uh, growth happens in two ways. One, you have uh, uh, shoot elongation. So gr growth is happening from the terminal ends. There's a bud at the end and it releases. So that's new new wood, comes out, comes out, come out, come out. And then growth also happens radially, radially uh, via the cambial here uh, and it increases in girth. And so, Needles are coming out um, the end point. Uh, but you can see the old leaf or needle scars on the old wood where they once occurred. So new points is the answer. We have a question here. Yeah. So uh, the question is about older trunks. And if we look around here, uh, you can see older trunks and do they have uh, growing points from them, right? And so when we think about a leaf and uh, what its purpose is, right? Which is to collect light uh, and turn it into energy for the plant. Uh, the plant's putting its resources in where the sun is. Right, and so if you put a lot of resources into growing new leaves on the old stems, it's a waste of of, of that of that uh, you know carbon to put the, the needle there. So, um, but some some trees, not, not all, uh, have what's called uh, latent latent buds um, or apocormic buds, where there are some dormant buds uh, on old wood, and you can see some right here, where if something were to happen to that tree, the top breaks off, those buds get exposed to sunlight, they might start growing more. And uh, so that does happen to some species. There's a question here. The so question about uh, fragrance in different uh, species. Um, and so we think about, you know, what makes a good uh, holiday tree, Christmas tree, and we think about some of the bringing a balsam fir, right, into your house or Fraser fir um, and warming it up and it starts to protrude. Um, 
the resins, you know, the, in the sap uh, is what's creating that smell. Um, and, you know, it's unique to some, some plant, some conifers are more strong and some are, are less, uh, but that's what you're smelling. A group of a line of four. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the question is about a tree uh, over over this ridge, and there's a group of them, and one of them is brown. That's a dead. <laughs> uh, so that one that one died so that those are uh, uh, red pines and red pines aren't uh, many conifers you know are grow at higher elevations or are uh, more northern climates and when you start bringing them into urban conditions uh, and the stresses of an urban environment um, they tend not to they tend to are more prone to disease and, and other things and uh, red pine is one of those things that's not very long lived within an urban uh, landscape. Um, I do want to point out uh, architecture of pines, um, and maybe we can take a walk in a minute. But typically, conifers start out as these pyramidal forms, right? And then with age, they turn into this, which is these like flat topped, multi branch things. But generally, uh, all your uh, the young uh, pines are are your kind of typical pyramidal form, um, and then uh, and then as they age, yeah, like this is a this one is like this, um, and they as they age they get more flat topped and broad at the top. Question is, do all conifers produce cones? And the answer is yes. And uh, a matter of fact. Uh, gymnosperms, which is a larger group. So there's flowering plants, which is angiosperms, and then there's gymnosperms, which is cone-bearing plants. Um, so who knows, other than conifers, the typical conifers, what are some of the other gymnosperms that produce cones? So ginkgo um, is a, is a uh, gymnosperm that has a fleshy cone. Right, but the mechanisms for pollination are very similar to what a what a what a fir does. There's a there's a little drop of uh, this is a different tree mop, but there's a little drop of um, uh, so a ginkgo fruit um, when it's uh, unfertilized, there it has a little tip and uh, it, it produces this little drop of uh, of um, substance that catch, catches the pollen and then it, it gets absorbed into the the plant and. Cones do the same thing, and we can look at that in the spring. Where would a cone be after Yeah, so um, cones are produced, and maybe uh, depending on yeah, the hemlock. That's what I was looking for. Here, here it is. So, depending on um, the the conifer in question, cones are typically produced. Uh, at the terminal tips or uh, at, at uh, like lateral branches. And so on hemlock, you can see this cone, which is from last year, wasn't produced at the very end. It was produced on one of these little side spurs. Um, but yeah, there's buds that are uh, vegetative and then there's buds that are uh, reproductive and, and, and the cones, male and female cones uh, emerge. I want to ask you about the sap. Um, so there are some rooted out. Is that is that normal or is that sign of some um, damage or yeah? Yeah. So excess sap that's just coming out. Mm -hmm. So um, the question is about uh, sap that's oozing out from conifer uh, trunks. Uh, it's several reasons that could be happening. I see some pruning cuts. You know where there's a old branch that was taken off where the sap is then protruding out uh this is called this right here this anybody know what this line of do, dots are yeah so it's a, a woodpecker family um called a sap sucker a bird uh and it produces these lines so that it could be oozing from that 
uh, there's insect, you know, insects that bore into um, trees. There's um, actually, we talked about kind of pest and disease and invasive species. Uh, there's a southern pine beetle, which is a native species in the south. With climate change, it's advancing north and north. It's on Cape Cod now. So it's, it's having devastating effects on uh, the pine populations on Cape Cod and the vineyard. And um, we're monitoring for that with the USDA here at the Arboretum. So we have traps out in the summertime trying to catch these. But a lot of these southern species that, you know, that the southern pine beetle evolved, co-evolved with things like um, your long ne needle pine. And so they have a, there's a relationship there. And this pine species has developed um, defenses against that beetle species when you then bring it into a, a uh, environment where it didn't evolve with like white pine those pines are don't have the defenses against it uh, and so that's how invasive species work right um, so yeah um, the, the the pine resin can be from a lot of things uh, as a as a mechanism the the tree exuding pine is pushing things out so it's like like when you bleed right uh you're you're pushing out bacteria and things to cleanse the wound your body's naturally doing it the pine it's another defense mechanism for pine and so if a plant is growing really healthy and it's really hydrated and there's not a whole lot of drought happening that that it, and something starts to peck in it or you get a beetle that's pushing into it uh that pine res that sap response is pushing out that infection or that invader when a plant is stressed and you know you, you don't have as much production of sap and, and water uh, that's reduced and then the, it's more vulnerable to the bores and other things hmm. any other questions online yes um what is the best way to germinate seed from pine cones and how long does that take the question is about uh germination of uh Pine, pine, pine cones specifically seed. Um, it's a great question, and um, species are going to differ. Um, but uh, and uh, the treatment of all seeds is going to differ. So when we when we collect uh, seeds from a pine tree, right, we're taking it out of nature, and uh, it would have gone through natural processes in in the environment. So. For example, um, uh, a pine tree might need a winter, several months of cold, to what we say is stratify the seed or make it able to germinate. And so when we bring seed in from anywhere, we look up its germination protocols and it might be uh, two months of wet, warm, and then followed by three months of uh, cold, wet, or some plants, go through the guts of birds, right? And so instead of capturing birds and putting the seed in the guts of a bird, we just put it in some kind of acid bath that mimics uh, digestive uh, properties. And that's how we stratify the seed. So every species is gonna differ in the exact way to stratify it. Um, and so I would just recommend that you, you know, research online to say uh, stratification or germin germination, uh, stratification of, whatever species you're looking to germinate and you'll get a, some of it, you know, they say, well, just file it with a nail file. Cause you got to break the outside of the shell and that'll, that'll germinate it. It's dependent on species. Any other online questions? We had a request from someone to talk about pitch pine. We had uh, a question to talk about pitch pine, anything specific. They did not give specifics. So leave it up to you. Um, let's see, what can I say about pitch pine? Well, I, what I would encourage is if you have any extra questions, you can just email them. Uh, and if you have any specific things you want to know, Maybe uh, I'm happy to answer them. To whether they do um, things with little needle drop. We're getting clapping here. <laughs> uh, it's been uh, a pleasure being with you today. I, after yesterday, right? which I took a quick walk out here yesterday and it was just windy and I was like, oh man, but I couldn't imagine a more beautiful day, 
right? And uh, the Arboretum director and I have been going back and forth on who's experienced the most beautiful day. And uh, so I'm gonna push this one towards them. And this was uh, an exceptional day. Uh, but anyways, really appreciate everybody. And, uh, and so much to learn and so much to share. And uh, thank you for attending.